You probably have heard that dominance in dogs stems from the hierarchical structure in wolves. And perhaps you've even heard that aggression or your dog's misbehavior stems from the fact that he's trying to assert his dominance or assert rank within your home. These are theories that get tossed around a lot within the dog training community, but today I really want to look at what the scientific literature says dominance is. And is there a specific behavior that your dog does that is establishing rank in some capacity? Is it an intrinsic personality trait? Is it a relationship dynamic? So if you're interested in a nerdy approach, keep watching. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to enhance your dog's mental health needs. On this channel, we break down scientific research in order to inform and educate us on how to train dogs. So if you're interested in a nerdier approach to canine cognition, make sure to hit that subscribe button. You may or may not have heard, but dominance within the dog training universe is a little bit contentious. Depending on which trainer you speak with, they might have different opinions on dominance theory and how it applies to training dogs. Now, today we're gonna look at the scientific literature around dominance. Um, and so for that purpose, I'm going to remove my personal opinion out of it. Um, I really want you guys to think for yourselves. So I'm going to give you the empirical fact and then you can kind of interpret that and see how it applies to you and your dog at home. Now, arguably the debate within the dog training community revolved around dominance stems from the debate within the scientific community. Yes, even the PhDs of the world seem to have a little bit of debate about defining what dominance in dogs is and what that looks like. But before we get into that debate, I kind of want to cover the things that all of the scientists can pretty much agree on, um, whether that is because it's fact or it's just a general consensus. First and foremost, dominance is real. <laughs> um, it is a real word. It is a real term. It really does exist within the ethological community. Um, it's not, you know, a quote unquote myth per se. From an ethological viewpoint, dominance is about a relationship dynamic between two individuals. Now, this is usually observed when resources are most essential. Here's what I mean. Imagine that you have a six month old baby at home. Now, you feed your baby, you give shelter for your baby, you pay for your baby's needs, you clean up your baby when he goes to the restroom. <laughs> you effectively provide all of the resources your six month old baby needs in order to survive. So when looking at the relationship between you, the parent and the six month old baby, you are the dominant individual in that relationship. And it's the same for dogs. But the other thing that all scientific community can agree on is that the dogs are not necessarily aware of this hierarchical dynamic. Going back to the baby reference, yes, your baby knows that you feed him. Your baby knows that, you know, when he cries, mom comes in, there's, there's a consequence to his behavior. He understands that but he's not necessarily going to be able to articulate or even fathom the complex construct of dominance, or he's not necessarily going to be able to form the construct that my mom is the dominant one in this relationship. And what's fact is that this is also true for your dog. In brief, this kind of comes down to the idea of first order representations and higher order representations. Now, First order representations are very simple. These are things that are very straightforward. But as humans, because we're newer species, we have the ability to construct more complex concepts. Um, these would be considered higher order representations. But dogs do not have this ability. Literally from a fundamental, like, physiological development, they, their brains are not equipped to be able to handle these higher constructs. So, Everybody within the scientific community understands that yes, dominance is a real thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the dogs are aware of it. And in fact, it's more something that humans have constructed and so therefore they're able to observe it when looking at dog dynamics. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the dogs are conscious of it or that they can even 
act upon it. Additionally, there are three main points that the entire scientific community can all agree on before we get to some of the discrepancies. First is that aggression is not equivalent to dominance. That is to say that just because you have a so-called dominant dog does not necessarily mean that your dog is aggressive. And likewise, just because your dog is aggressive, that definitely doesn't necessarily mean that your dog is displaying dominance. The two are not the same. Secondly, any human trying to quote unquote assert dominance over their dog using something like the alpha rule is not only unnecessary, um, it's borderline dangerous. This is something that Bradshaw at all goes to the point of saying that anyone practicing dominance theories is unethical and unnecessary and definitely dangerous to you and your dog. Thirdly, there is no evidence to indicate that the mounting behavior is to quote unquote assert dominance. In fact, much of the scientific literature that has looked at mounting behaviors has indicated it as something more of play strategy. And that is something that was supported in the study we looked at in this video. So if you want more about that, I would check out that video. Now we definitely do need more research that examines the mounting behavior and, and empirically proves that it is not correlated or does not serve the purpose of domination. However, the general opinion, the general consensus within the scientific community is that the two are not correlated and very likely the mounting behavior does not serve the function of asserting dominance or asserting rank. Now from here is where some of the opinions start to divide. See, what happens is you can take a study that examines a group of dogs, right? And you can say that within a 25 minute span, dog A rested his chin over dog B 25 times. That is, I'm just throwing numbers out, right? That can be proven, that is empirically fact, you know, dog A did this X amount of times to dog B. Okay, cool, dog A rested his chin over dog B. Did he do that because he's trying to antagonize play? Did he do that because he's trying to assert rank? Did he do that because he wanted to breed with the dog? Like, what was the purpose of him doing that? Proving intentionality and proving purpose is really hard to do from a scientific standpoint because we cannot just ask the dogs, hey, why did you rest your chin on that dog's head? And so the interpretation of what is happening internally, what is the motivation for why a behavior is being displayed is where all of the subjectivity, where all of the opinions come into play. In a 2014 paper, Schilder et al. argued that in addition to dominance being something that is observed by humans in a relationship dynamic between dogs, in addition to that, Dominance is also a personality trait which is intrinsic to an individual. In brief, they argued that when looking at human dynamics, humans are able to decipher the quote unquote dominant one in a relationship very quickly and so therefore dogs are also able to assert this very quickly as well. It can be concluded that a number of human characteristics of communicative signals related to dominance of submission resemble dog communication. Now, I don't necessarily have the time to go through all of their points. I am putting it on the screen, and if you're interested, I do recommend you pause and read through some of their paragraphs. That said, one of the things that they point to is things like when humans are feeling insecure or they're feeling, um, for lack of a better word, subordinate, they will avert their eyes or they'll bow their heads. And so those are also signals, therefore, that can be observed in dogs that serve the same purpose. They say things like when the dog is trying to get higher on a couch, he is trying to assert rank um, because when a person is tall, they often will tower over to make themselves more dominant. Now, quite frankly, the vast majority of the canine cognition researchers are quick to point out that this is something called anthropomorphizing, which is basically where we take something that a human does and automatically apply it to a different species. This is something that is highly frowned upon within the scientific community. Um, we try to look at species as individuals and look at what they're capable of and not necessarily uh, link the two between each other. Yes, my dog is knocking over cameras left and right, I'm sorry. 
That said, one thing that I think Shilder et al. points out that I think is really important to you at home is that in all of the studies which argue that dominance is an intrinsic personality trait, um, that there is status signals, status behaviors that dominant dogs do, in those studies that argue that point, one thing that is factual is that submissive behaviors are more observable than dominant behaviors. And what this means is that if you at home believe my dog is dominant, statistically speaking, you will not see your dog display these so-called dominant behaviors like rest his chin. Statistically speaking, that's not going to happen very often. What will happen more frequently is that submissive dogs will do things like display their belly or bow their head to your dog if you believe that's what's actually going on. Now this video isn't necessarily about submissive behaviors and if you're interested in me doing a scientific approach to submissive behaviors, make sure to hit like and comment below like I want submissive behaviors um, and maybe that video will come in the future. In opposition to the shoulder at all argument that dominance is a personality trait, Bradshaw et al. came out and was like, mm, we have to disagree. And here are their couple of points. First, we know that factually, dogs do not have the brain capacity in order to understand these more complex constructs. Then in Bradshaw et al.'s opinion, reasonably speaking, they would not be, dogs would not be able to constantly compete to try to be higher up on the ranking scale if they're not aware that a ranking scale is in place. Additionally, Bradshaw et al. argues that therefore, because the dogs are not aware of the hierarchical structure, it really serves no importance to dogs whatsoever. Within their little world, within their little brains, it has little importance. And actually, this is just something that researchers use um, as a construct to benefit themselves. Thirdly, they argue that dominance is not a personality trait and that there's no evidence to support that, um, that this is something that strictly remains within a relationship dynamic and it usually revolves around resources. And finally, they argue that it is unethical and unprofessional to argue that a dog can conceive a construct of human ideology without having the physiological capability within their brains to do so. Now that you have heard both sides of this argument, plus you've also heard the empirical fact, the main question boils down to, does it even matter? Does this debate automatically affect you and your dog and your relationship with your dog? In a 2015 response paper to these two arguments, Dr. Carrie Westgarth argued even as experienced scientists, it's possible to be looking at the same data from different perspectives and seeing a different truth. But is there really a need to view animals in the light of dominance in order to explain why they do what they do? The idea of dominance in dogs is not a problem to be solved, but a question of individual interpretation and philosophy. Therefore, Perhaps our energy should move away from debating whether dominance in dogs exists to what training methods we can all promote for use. So my question for you that I want you to answer in the comment section below is, does defining dominance in dogs really matter? Is it integral into your ability to train your dog, to understand your dog? And I, I have intentionally left my personal opinions out of this video in the hopes that you can form your own opinion looking at the empirical facts and also the different sides of this argument. But if you're still unsure on what to think, I have linked a ton of the resources and the studies in the description box below and I really encourage you to read them, learn, absorb, and analyze. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button to let the YouTube algorithm know. And if you have any questions, make sure to ask in the comment section below. Subscribe for more nerdy content, and I'll see you guys soon. You should go play. <laughs>